One of the most important things that companies need to be aware of is how to craft and take international business information as it relates to their company and put it into uh, a little more formal structure. And one of the things that companies are looking at is putting together an export operations manual. So I'm going to take a little different approach to my presentation here uh, and adjust it from talking to a company to economic development individuals like yourself who are working out in the community with such companies. So um, on your handout materials and on the screen, you can see some of the six key steps to successful export planning and developing an operations manual. Uh, the key one is accessing the market, followed by evaluating the product, moving your product, finding qualified buyers, choosing the terms of sale, and obtaining trade financing. Uh, one of the most critical issues for international business, as I mentioned, is assessing the market. Um, and assessing the market encompasses two different areas of international trade. Uh, one is doing your macro market research. And under macro market research, a company should be looking at the internal structure of their company, what their products are, what their domestic market is and sales structures, some of their financing tools domestically, but also looking to see what their competition is doing in the domestic market and identifying, most importantly, the consumer they're trying to sell to. After a company has identified those key areas, they have a pretty good grasp of what their company is and what their financial strength is and what their objections, objectives and goals are. Um, moving forward from there on the micro level, this is where companies now can take a broader stroke in looking at the world to see where their competition as, is and where they're uh, developing markets, but also some of the similarities in countries where their consumer is at. Um, an example might be uh, looking at Canada as a potential market. There may be similarities between their U.S. companies uh, and buyers with the same buying habits as in Canada. So this is a good way to start looking at the world from a macro side and identifying a few key areas that um, are similar to the United States and their consumer. Typically, most companies should be looking at about four or five countries to start their market research. One of the things that I've found over the years is that a lot of companies, when they're going international, have had a tendency to try and shotgun the world. They don't stay focused in their key industry sector or the key areas where their consumer is located at. Unfortunately, you spend a lot of time and a lot of dollars uh, that, became wasted, that become wasted resources. And unfortunately, that's where the finance department or key managers look at international and see it as a, an area that's uh, prohibitive or too costly to venture into. Uh, typically, after a company has looked at the macro research side and they've started to identify potential marketplaces, we'll say maybe three or four countries, this is where you start to drill down into your market research and look at the micro side of it. And the micro side of it is looking at each country and finding out what the political forces are within that country. I identifying what is going on politically in that country and its relationship to other countries. Uh, the political relationship between that country and doing business with the United States or identifying political partnerships between countries with regard to free trade. Um, those particular elements are going to help you decide what the political risk for investing in that country are, and also the political risk to partnering with a potential buyer in that area. Another area of concern um, when it comes to the market research and the micro market side of it is identifying what the legal system is. And as companies start to go international, one of the important areas is identifying how you're going to sell your product in that country 
and how you plan on putting together potential contracts with distributors, uh, potential lease agreements with uh, building owners, a variety of different issues that may have some legal implications to you in the short term, but more importantly, in the long term. So understanding the legal system and the issues related to those particular elements of international trade and the legal system uh, can be daunting, but it's pretty critical that you start identifying those issues and putting together kind of a, a legal team of experts to help you identify the risk for going international. One of the large areas or the uh, area of bigger concern to companies going international is identifying their intellectual property rights and their trademarks. Uh, starting to launch in the international area, a lot of times the big concern is identifying and getting your trademark registered in a region that you're going to go to. Now, one of the reasons why I'm identifying this issue now is because how much is it going to cost you now to put these elements of legal market research together? So as we go through each of these steps, and I'm talking about the different issues related to international trade, think about the cost that it, you're going to go through. And this is one of the things that uh, assistance to companies uh, is important in helping them put together a financial program for success in the international marketplace. In addition to the legal system, it's important that your clients identify the economic uh, components of doing business in that country or that region. What's the relationship of the currency value with the US dollar? What's the currency value now versus where it has been and some of the projections to the future? What's going on politically that may affect the legal system and the currency value that you're going to be making that sale in? At this particular juncture, this is where a company needs to start looking at issues related to when they're going to get paid and how long it's going to take to get paid. Because as you project forward and you've quoted a sale, if you have any type of a currency exchange, what's the potential value of that currency at the time of delivery and payment? And again, this is why it's important to not only talk to your legal counsel, but also to start working with your international banker so you can figure out the financials and put together a structure of payment that's going to benefit your particular clients so that their cash flow moves forward successfully and positively. So in addition to those three key areas, it's also important to address some of the cultural issues for doing business internationally and in the countries that you've been doing business in or countries you're looking at doing business in. Uh, the cultural elements really help dictate uh, the political structure and the socioeconomic elements and also the legal practices within that particular country. So again, you're not just looking at, oh, what's happening in this country, but you're also looking to see how is this going to affect me doing business in those countries. And what's important about doing your micro market research and your macro market research is it also helps you identify some of the risks associated with doing business in those countries and then putting together uh, a scenario to help you mitigate some of that risk. At this particular point, you also start to refine the countries of choice that you've put together. You can now look to see, okay, this country has a little too much political risk for us, or this particular country doesn't practice intellectual property rights or trademark guidelines uh, that the rest of the uh, countries of the world have uh, identified. So, at micro research, this is where you really drill down into what's going on in that country, what's the relationships with that country, 
and your company and the United States or various other business partners. The micro research side of it is also not just limited to those political, economic, legal sort of forces that I talked about, but it also requires that you really look into what it takes to get your product through customs, the delivery systems, any type of duties, tariff, any type of special certifications, packaging, a whole gambit of smaller issues that companies I see forget to look at or don't have a reference point to uh, having the knowledge to get that market research. And that's one of the things that um, we in our office and the federal government and trade partners like yourself try and do. We try and give these companies the information to help them get started and then that allows us to help them fine tune their market research so that they begin to put together a skill set for market research that they can carry on within their company. Um, the other thing that's important about the micro research is it also helps you begin to put together costs associated with doing international business. And what's important about all these steps is you're really working towards putting together a true export price based on some real life numbers. It's also hard for a company to start doing international business when they don't have a benchmark or a reference point to moving their company forward into the international marketplace. And what I find is if you go through these six steps or a company goes through these six steps, they're starting to gather information to put together their own benchmark for how to work in the international marketplace. Um, step two, after a company has done their market research and they've identified potential countries that they wanna go to, and they've started to look at the micro research, um, they should be identifying how their product needs to be adapted towards that foreign marketplace. Now typically most companies are trying to standardize their product in order to get into multiple markets and be able to reduce the cost of doing business. Unfortunately, that isn't the case in a lot of countries and with a lot of products that a company has. So understanding how to adapt or modify your product to the foreign market place, place is a critical issue in that how much is it going to cost you to adapt your product with regards to possibly packaging and handling and advertising all the way down to the color of your product, which is affected by the culture of the country you're looking at doing business at. Um, we've seen a number of companies here in the United States and in Oregon who have gone international uh, with their product, but what they found is the modification of their product for the foreign market can be cost prohibitive. If there's a certain guideline in a certain country where they may have to modify the product according to the guidelines in that country, how much is it gonna cost to retool? Can they get a financial loan in order to purchase a certain type of equipment? Will they be able to put on or can they afford uh, a new labor force, or what type of training do they have to have in place uh, for the machinery that they need to order. So again, there's a whole host of different things that a company needs to think about, and these all come with a particular price. So again, this is another expense that a company is starting to look at, is if we're gonna go international, do we have the equipment and the labor force within the company to help them be successful. Because not understanding the true cost or the true timeline of product modification can really affect the strength and growth of a company in the international marketplace. Um, we've seen companies where they've adapted the product to the foreign market, but um, when it came to getting the financing for certain elements of that, they couldn't get a bank loan because it was an international sale and the risk was far too high for the banks to, uh, to loan on that. And this is what's important when Jeff comes up 
is to get a better understanding of the tools for uh, international financing to help a company along with this. Uh, all of these things, again, come with also a time element. When it comes to doing the market research and putting it all together, um, the marketing department understanding now what it takes with regard to time and cost for producing a product, and then working with the finance department to understand can we really launch this product within this time frame, and how much is that going to cost? Because once you start doing your market research and you start identifying potential buyers in a foreign company, and you're starting to sell and go to those trade shows, can you produce and can you deliver? And again, as you put together your business plan and your operations plan, you should have a timeline in place in addition to the cost for investment so that when you are ready to go international, you do have the product in place and ready to go and you can meet those companies or buyers' uh, expectations when it comes to delivery of that product. Unfortunately, companies uh, that we've worked with who have not looked or taken this type of approach and had to cancel their orders at the very last minute because they could meet, not meet the production timelines have lost future sales. It's really hard to regain your credibility in the industry once you make a sale, put everything in motion, and have to cancel your order at the last minute. Because your buyer has already, hopefully, pre-sold that item, and they have made commitments to somebody else. And if there's a glitch in the system, it reflects badly on them. It may not get reflected back to you from the end user, but who they're buying it from is, is reflected back on them. And unfortunately, companies don't have time for mistakes like that. They'll typically cut you out of the picture. So understanding the product modification is not necessarily or only just adapting the product to the foreign marketplace, but now looking to see if we have to gear up, how much is that going to cost us, what's the time frame involved with that. When you go back and you look at your market research and your micro and your, your macro side of it, how long is it going to take you to do that research and how much is it going to cost? So again, each one of these steps do have a cost associated with it. And this is the thing that your particular clients need to be aware of as they put together their planning structure. Um, the third step that we have is really identifying moving your product. And a company needs to be aware of not just the logistics of getting their product in a box or a container and shipped to the foreign country. It also involves looking at the movement within the country and how your distributor moves the product to the end user. And a lot of times that's not just the physical movement of the product that I'd mentioned. So, moving your product and understanding the network and the system for delivery and selling a product uh, is also important. And I think that's one of the resources that um, our organizations and the services that you can provide your client are the things that um, we try to identify and information we try to collect through our foreign offices um, that a variety of our, our organizations have around the world. In moving your product internationally, it's important also to identify your uh, export sales structure. Are you going to be using a distributor in that foreign country? Are you going to be selling uh, directly or indirectly? Are you going to be hiring an export management company? Uh, are you going to be using a certain trading company in order to sell into that country? And typically, through your market research, you should also be identifying these particular mechanisms for moving and selling your product. In Japan, for example, the typical way to sell there is through trading companies. And what's the advantage now to using a trading company in that country? That's something you have to look at. 
um, when you're using a distributor in a foreign country, some of the issues you might address is, will they be able to inventory product for us, which will save us on shipping because we'll be able to sell and ship on economies of scale, giving us a reduced shipping cost. So again, you're now looking at, or a company is now looking at, different ways to sell, but different ways that are going to help them increase their profit margin. So if I was selling to a trading company and they are handling the process and the purchase all the way from my facility here in Oregon to Tokyo, I have a lot of labor reduction and internal management reduction, which all have a cost associated with that. It tends to be a little easier uh, to sell to a trading company, but one of the disadvantages to using a trading company and the way you set up your legal contract with your distributor is how do you collect information? So again, the mechanism for selling and distributing into a country may seem like a simple process and make it easy for you, but in three, four or five years, have you been able to collect information? And if you're putting together an agreement with a distributor, there are certain things that you might want to write into your legal contract where you now have the ability to gather information, to find out who they're selling to, how that product is now moved, moving to that end user. A whole host of different things uh, can become involved in that. And again, time becomes an issue on that, and also the cost becomes an issue as you put together a type of a program like that. So as you're looking at moving the product, there's a little more to it than just putting together a distribution agreement or finding a distributor. It's important now to start thinking strategically towards the future. And this is where it's important, and I see a lot of companies starting to do this nowadays, is they are taking all the information that is out there, and they are beginning to think strategically. Okay, if we do this market research and we're getting this information, how can we now use this to move forward and be able to now help us identify strengths and weaknesses within our company? If we're going to be looking at certain types of distribution markets or opportunities in this country, which is the best one for us to use that's going to allow us to now take advantage of economies of scale in, in distribution into that foreign country? What is our contract going to be with payment terms now with our distributor? Is there a certain way we want to work it that's going to allow us now to take advantage of that and increase our profit margins? So with a distributor, are you going to give them net 30, net 60? What's the advantages to that or the disadvantages to that? You may want to start looking at those contracts so you can identify the payment transfer times because the finance department needs to know how to structure the cash flow. So a lot of the bottom line of all this research is to help a company start to think strategically on why they're doing an international process a certain way and identifying really what the financial costs and impacts are to the company. The time frame for getting into the international marketplace so it's realistic and then also helping the finance department understand the cash flow movement of money so that they know how to plan and structure ahead. So in addition to um, moving the product is qualifying your buyer. So in qualifying your buyer, uh, I've noticed sometimes companies are a little hesitant to uh, spend the money to do a lot of the really good due diligence and market research uh, on finding the right distributor or the right trading company to help you be successful in the international marketplace. Um, what's important about this is when you're putting together a contract with somebody, you may not be able to get out of it according to the legal structure within that country. 
So again, identifying how you want to sell your product in that country and where you want to be placed in the future is critical to the investment of the time and the money that you're putting into qualifying a buyer. A lot of times companies will begin with talking to associates or colleagues within their own community which have been doing international, which have a pretty good perspective on some of the issues that they've had to go through in order to break into a market and find the best or most qualified uh, partner for selling the product in that country. The other uh, way and approach to take in looking for qualified buyers is to go to the foreign country and attend the trade shows. And your goal might not be just to sell a product, but your goal may be to gather information to help you figure out the movement of goods within that particular country or region of the world, to listen to what's happening um, with different companies that are at the trade show and some of the issues that they've been running into. I know a number of the trade shows that I've been with uh, and gone th to for the state of Oregon, our Oregon companies have gathered a lot of information on distributors not to do business with and policies within countries that they may want to avoid. You don't always see that in a written textbook or in the news, but when you're on the floor talking to your colleagues, uh, you really gather a lot of really good information. Unfortunately, when uh, some key managers within a company see that you're going to a trade show, they don't always understand the purpose and objective of the trade show aside from making a sale. And as you put together your export strategy or your operations manual or your business plan, you're now showing uh, management or your finance team and your logistics team or your other partners within the company that this is what our plan is for international. And in order to qualify buyers, this is the process we need to go through. Our research shows that we need to be in those countries at those trade shows, not just to try and make a sale, but maybe to start getting our name out there. And also now to start building our credibility in the industry as a player, and also to gather information on the best way to sell and distribute and how to qualify our buyer so we have a successful uh, partner in moving forward internationally. And again, I think this is what's important about taking advantage of the services that are out there through uh, Department of Commerce with their key people that are in uh, foreign countries, uh, from the state of Oregon with our trade partners that we have in foreign countries. And again, this is the service that we can provide you to help you provide the service back to the companies and the community that you're working in. Step five is um, where you start to get into some of the basics of international business. How are you going to quote your sale? And how are you gonna set up the delivery system? And even though this may sound like a presentation on just the basics of how to put together your document or shipping, there is a strategy and approach to using this within your company. Once you've looked at a country and you've identified how you're going to sell the product and how you're going to move that product within a country and you've figured out your distribution, well now looking at the best way to maximize delivery where you can now increase your profit margins by selling on economies of scale or selling at a certain time of delivery so that your payment now happens at a particular time. It's not unheard of for companies to quote an export sale where the buyer picks it up at their dock. What that means is you're getting paid at that particular time. If you're setting it up so you're going to make delivery and get paid when it gets to the foreign country, by the time you go through production time and 
couple days at the port and four weeks getting to the foreign country and then offloaded, you've actually now floated money for maybe two months, possibly even three months, depending on your production time. So again, this has a cost associated with it. And if you can now figure out a delivery system that may help you shave off a quarter of a percent or whatever it's going to be, that's a big savings. It also helps you now work with your cash flow so that you know what the investment of money is going to be before you get a return on that investment. So if you take this approach and you go back to your distributor and you now know that with your agreement, he's going to inventory 30 days worth of product, uh, which allows you now to ship a full container and take advantage of economies of scale and delivery. Plus, you're not going to be paying for warehousing because it's part of the agreement and part of the pricing structure you put together. But you may have to give him net 30 or net 60 for payment because his particular group of buyers want to pay a net 30 or net 60. So again, you see how there's a trade-off when it comes to international, and you, through your market research, need to understand the options that are out there and put, the, to put together the costs associated with that. So again, you have a really true guideline for what it costs to do business in that foreign country. Now, there are international terms to a transaction which are called INCO terms. And you can look those up online. Your clients can look those up online. But what they do is they talk about the different delivery systems uh, that are available for moving your cargo to the foreign country. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that now, but um, that particular information we have available. But also your freight forwarder or your company's freight forwarder can help you with identifying those particular steps. Um, it's important also that in working with your companies that aside from the lawyer that they should be looking or talking to or getting counsel from and your international banker, it's important to start working with your freight forwarder. And a freight forwarder is somebody who helps you make your shipping um, uh, programs for getting your product to that foreign country. They're really key to your export uh, or international business processes. So in working with your companies, the key things that they should be looking at is uh, their international banker, their legal team, their freight forward or customs broker. But then also going back to the very beginning when we were talking about they need to understand the uh, information that's available out there to help them do their basic market research. This is all going to help them put together a timeline for going into the international marketplace. They can now identify, if we're gonna go international, it's gonna take us three months to do market research. If we're gonna go international, then we need to go to these key trade shows and they're at these times of the year. And then you can go back and you can attach costs to the market research in the time and also the labor that's going to go into it. So at each step along the way in the time frame, you know exactly how much it's going to cost and also how long it's going to take. And you may go through the first step of market research and identify this is exactly what we need to do but we can't do it yet because some of our other business commitments domestically. Let's hold off for another three months before we go into phase two of putting together that particular program. So this again is where a company starts to think and act strategically with the information and the dollars that they have to put together a program that's going to be successful for them for the long term. The last thing that they should be looking at is um, their finance options for selling international and how they're going to get paid. Now, even though I said this is, you know, one of the last things they should be looking at, it's actually something that comes back full circle to the beginning. So 
everything that I've outlined is actually basic things that you should now move back and adjust your market research to. You should now be looking at, okay, if we're going to go international, when we go to the micro side of it, what's our financing options in doing business there? If we're going to sell in this particular country, what's the delivery systems? If we go by air cargo, if we go by UPS Federal Express, if we go by container, what's happening there, and what's the cost associated with this? I think one of the main takeaway points that companies have commented on uh, that we've worked with is this is a really good way not just to identify the time and the cost, but it also helps make the export price of their product realistic. Because if you're going to go into the, a foreign country, you really need to know how many units you need to sell at a certain price and understand what the return on that investment is going to be and when you're going to start getting a return on that investment. By doing this type of market research and understanding and putting together an export program like this or an operations manual, you've begun to build that benchmark for your company so you know and you feel secure about what your export price is. You know the legal obligations that you need to have in order to go international. You have a better understanding of the cash flow within your company and you have a better understanding of when you're going to be able to get into the international marketplace, how long it's going to take to be successful in the international marketplace, and when you're going to get a return on that investment. Those are all questions and variables that people who are looking at getting in, into international are looking for, and that's why they're coming to you as economic development partners to help them or guide them in the right directions for gathering this information so that they can help synthesize it into a program that works for them.